one. Been thinking how best to word this for a while and giggling to myself over how it played out. To set the stage, this is in the UK and was on this Christmas day recently past. I am a 54 year old man and my wife had booked a table at a local pub for Christmas dinner. My stepson, 34, and his girlfriend and son, who is 12 years old, from a previous relationship were joining us as well. Me and my wife picked up his son and his mother and the three of us were to meet my stepson at the venue. We got there first and bought our drinks. Missy's had a glass of Prosecco, grandson had a glass of Coke and myself, for the first time in about 10 years as I don't drink alcohol, a pint of lager. My grandson is a smashing kid, quite quiet with a great sense of humor. I love winding him up and doing my best to shock him or get a reaction from him. Normally, I'm met with eye-rolling or a crooked smile that says, Grow up, Gramps. You're funny, but I'm not going to rise to the occasion for you. My stepson is also a great sport. He has a fantastic sense of humor, and the two of us at times have spent moments pranking each other or engaging in meme wars or insults through Messenger and Facebook. Stepson has texted that they'd arrived and were about to come join us. When I had a sudden flash of inspiration... I had taken a few sips of my drink and quickly asked my grandson to switch his with mine. The grin on his face told me he instantly knew what I was up to, and glasses were quickly swapped before his dad saw. Pleasantries and greetings were exchanged, and asked what he and his girlfriend wanted to drink. Stepson looked down briefly at what we were drinking, and with a frozen smile on his face said, He's drinking lager. Before I continue, my stepson loves to wind people up, play jokes and see people's reactions to his shenanigans. He's also a great dad and considers himself to be one of the lads. On saying he's drinking lager, my wife quick off the mark says yes, it's what he asked for. Kids are allowed to have a drink with their meal. It's a pint though, he says, a pint of lager. Smile still frozen in place. Well, I am 12 now, dad, says grandson with a classic straight face. It was actually his birthday on the 22nd of December. What followed was the grim rictus of a smile still on stepson's face, with a furrowed brow and eyes desperately rolling around in his head trying to find an answer. It's lager, though, was all he could come up with. We let him out of his misery by not being able to contain laughter much longer. The relief on his face, enormous. At no point did my 12-year-old actually drink any of it, though, and he happily drank his coke after. 2. I am a disabled veteran, and at the time this actually happened, I was solely depending on a walking stick. I could not walk more than 10 feet maximum without assistance. I was asked by a friend to be a bridesmaid at her wedding. She quickly proved herself to be a bridezilla from hell, and everything had to meet her vision. Everything had to fall within her very rigid scope of what the aesthetics should be. She made a couple of what she claimed were innocent comments about my walking stick. I offered multiple times not to be a bridesmaid, and would assist in any other way I could help. She refused every offer and insisted I had to be a bridesmaid. Then I heard from another close friend, who is also a bridesmaid, that she was very upset that I was insisting on using my walking stick. She made a comment saying that she was just going to hide it and then I would have to go without it. Looking at the mutual friend's face when she said that, she tried to laugh it off as a joke. Well, there was no doubt in my mind that she was going to try to have my walking stick go missing, so I made arrangements. Sure enough, the day of the wedding rolls around, and while getting my hair and makeup, my walking stick disappears. I was not happy, and told everyone I have to have it back. I cannot walk down the aisle without it. The bride insisted that they didn't know where it was, and they looked everywhere, and I was just going to have to make do. I said, so after you joked about taking my walking stick, it goes missing. And you want me to make do. Her exact words were, you'll just have to do what you can to get up the aisle. Cue malicious compliance. I texted my boyfriend, he went out to the car and brought in a mobility scooter that I had rented just in case I needed it. I had him put it out of sight where we could get to it easily and then he or the other bridesmaids physically supported me. We made our way to the back of the hall for the start of the ceremony. 
The bride, who had been talking to her father and not paying attention, did not see the scooter until she started to walk up the aisle. And there are her three bridesmaids. Two standing tall and me sitting on the most hideous looking multicolored with sparkles mobility scooter I could find. If looks could kill, she would have planted me. Within seconds of the ceremony ending, my walking stick had been found. She and her new husband brought it over to me and told me that it had been found and I could get the god-awful scooter back out to the car. I mustered up a tear and told her I was so sorry, but I was in so much pain from having to try to walk without my walking stick that there was no way I would be able to go without the scooter. I am very proud to say that the scooter is in over 90% of her wedding photos. 3. I worked for a company with great pay and benefits, one of which was vacation days. I worked there for years without any performance or attendance issues. I was also an employee who would not work overtime. I gave 100% while I'm there. That's all I have to offer, other than that, no issues. Each day I pre-planned my vacation days. We had to put our plans on a calendar for approval and I wanted to receive my approval before confirming my plans, so I did everything as early as possible. I had no vacation request problems for years and did not hear of other employees having issues with their vacation time or pay. Then one year, all of a sudden, after using all but four of my vacation days, management said I had no additional paid vacation time. I reviewed our online handbook, gathered my requested and approved time off, and checked my check stubs to verify the paid vacation days I'd taken thus far. I presented everything to management for research. My direct manager said he checked and I didn't have four additional vacation days. Well, that wasn't good enough, so I asked him to forward it to his manager. His manager said the same thing. Well, that wasn't good enough. Eventually my concerns reached the center manager. The center manager called me into a meeting. I again presented my findings, showing I had four unused vacation days left. He then began discussing changes to our vacation policy while making eye contact and smiling. He turned his computer around to show me the new handbook they constructed reflecting the new vacation policy. Wait a minute, what? There's an online employment handbook? Yet I am supposed to go buy a new handbook not known to employees? Make that make sense. I politely said okay and walked out. I removed my four vacation days from the vacation calendar. I then began chatting to other employees to see the number of days they had taken for that year and the number of days they might have left. Conversations like, how was your vacation? How long did you stay? Are you choosing a different place to spend the rest of your vacation days? Asking these and related questions allowed me to calculate the number of vacation days they used or had remaining. I did not find one other employee having my issue with vacation time. I waited a couple of months and filed a lawsuit while working there. Other employees did not know about my lawsuit, at least not from me, but I'm sure management knew. The lawsuit discovery process revealed an email chain. The email chain showed the center manager directly asking human resources about my four unused vacation days, and human resources confirming I had four unused vacation days. The center manager used a fictitious new handbook to cover his and other management actions, denying my unused vacation time. Shortly after that we settled, and they paid thousands for four unused vacation days. I had to resign, of course and the center manager and other management lost their positions, retired, or quit. All I wanted was my unused, paid vacation time. But what I received was much more. 4. My first job after graduating high school in 2008 was as an office employee in the distribution center in my hometown for one of the statewide newspapers. In retrospect, it was actually fun for the most part. My scheduled hours were 12 a.m. to 6.30 a.m. with Tuesdays and Wednesdays off, which worked for me because I enjoy nighttime, and even today I still work mid-shift. The assistant manager, Aaron, and I got along well, and the other two people in the office, Doug and Scott, were good guys too. 
The only problem we had was our manager, Barb. Looking back on it, she could have gotten in trouble for a bunch of the stuff she pulled. Forcing us, who were hourly employees, to put only 40 hours max per week on our timesheets, when we were actually working 55 plus hours a week. Downgrading Aaron from salary-based assistant manager position to an hourly position, while still working as the assistant manager, and even driving by our houses to see if our cars were in our driveway. If we called in sick, yes, she actually did this to me. When she wasn't doing illegal and invasive stuff like that, she was just being annoying as shit. On Mondays, Aaron and I were usually the only ones scheduled to work. Simple nights and small papers, so it was an easy day. A few times, for whatever reason, Barb showed up just out of the blue. We'd ask her why she was there, and her reply was, I don't know, just felt I need to be here. And then she retreated to her office. So what led to and what was my petty revenge? In early 2011, after over a year of constant overtime hours not getting counted, route carriers coming and going, of which meant us office employees had to deliver those down routes, and one day Doug just never showed up again which I truly don't blame him. I had enough and actively started searching for a new job. It was on a Friday in March. I got a call that I was hired by a company and they asked when I could start. I told them just let me tie up some loose ends at my current job and I'll start on Monday. Which that tells you I had zero intentions of doing a two week notice. But as a courtesy, I did at least get together with Aaron for dinner and I told him what was going to happen so he would know for the following Monday. He had been on leave at the time. On that Sunday, we had four down routes which we had been dealing with for over a month already. As mentioned earlier, there was another office employee, Scott, but he couldn't deliver routes due to some medical conditions he had. So Barb and myself had each delivered two whole routes by ourselves. I told her that I would go ahead and work to the later time, 10am, after delivering my routes in order to handle any calls for re-deliveries, papers accidentally missed by carriers, to give to our re-delivery driver. Of course, I did this specifically so I could close everything up and leave my key. As 9.50am came, I typed up my resignation letter that I later taped onto Barb's office door. In that letter, I specifically stated... I will no longer answer phone calls from anyone associated with this company. And rest assured, if anyone shows up at my residence, they will have the police called on them. At 10am, I taped it onto her door, locked all the doors, put my key into her office letterbox, and left out a door that locked from the inside and never went or looked back, leaving Barb to be down another office employee. The absolute cherry on top of everything was Aaron quit two weeks after I quit. 5. I moved into my apartment about two months ago, and I noticed that many basic maintenance issues, example moldy leaking ceilings, boiler not rooted to the ground, broken windows, pipes that leaked debris, unsafe wiring, heating did not turn on, some outlets and smoke alarms didn't work, etc. That I had discussed with the broker prior to moving in had not been fixed. Despite the broker's assurances that these would all be addressed before the move-in. Additionally, no one had bothered to clean anything. So when I should have been unpacking and setting up my new home with my wife, I was busy on my hands and knees all day scrubbing every dirt-caked surface. Fast forward a few days. We speak once again to the broker and to the building management about the conditions which were not fixed. They send a superintendent who does not speak any English and who disappears before fixing the issues, but not before leaving a mess. This repeats for a week until I finally call the city, who sends an inspector. Turns out the above listed conditions of the apartment are deemed illegal, and the landlord is given a certain window of time, either 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days, to fix each specific issue before fines begin to accrue. City inspectors keep coming to check on the repairs. Meanwhile, 
a manager from the building is emailing us, saying that we never gave them proper notice of the issues, and is saying that we are in the wrong for calling the city. The other representatives from the management agency back her up, totally ignoring all our previous conversations, many of which were in writing via email. Once I prove that we did indeed describe the issues to them, they blame me for not allowing them access to my apartment to do the repairs, which had still not been completed due to workers disappearing before the repairs were complete, as well as them not showing up at agreed-upon times. Lots of angry emails go back and forth, which ultimately led to nothing. Two months into our lease, which is about a week ago, most of the repairs had finally been completed. Turns out, however, that when city inspectors were here, they noticed that the front door does not automatically close. Apparently, that is required for fire safety reasons. I honestly don't get it, but I don't particularly care. Because at this point, I am pissed. Workers were here to fix the door while the city inspector came and told them that the door must close automatically from 30 degrees. Now, the workers don't seem to be so skilled in math, and they clearly were not able to estimate what a 30-degree angle looked like. They saw that the door closed automatically from a much larger angle than 30 degrees and assumed it was okay. Tired of dealing with unreliable workers and the management in denial, I kept my knowledge to myself. After they left, I measured my door, which is 36 inches wide. If the door is open to a 30-degree angle, the door can be viewed as a hypotenuse of a far-right-angle triangle with degree measures of 30, 60, and 90. Taking the sine of 30 degrees and multiplying it by the hypotenuse length thus yields the length of the opposite leg of the triangle. In other words, the door would need to self-close when the edge of the door is 18 inches away from the door frame. Did the door actually do that? Of course not. Now, the management believes this issue to be fixed, but next time the city shows up to inspect if it has indeed been fixed, I will show them the math and demonstrate how the door does not properly close. Fees for this issue not being remedied are accruing at a rate of $250 a day. Once the city sees that the issue still has not been fixed, the fees may escalate even more. The next phase is creating leaflets about tenants' rights how to get the city to lower one's rent if living conditions are poor, and how to call the city inspectors to find the landlord for unaddressed maintenance issues. I have patiently waited for two months for issues to be fixed that never should have existed in the first place in an apartment that is being newly rented out. Don't treat your tenant well, then be prepared for the full extent of the law to be applied and made fully known to all your other tenants. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge is Ice Cream, episode 335. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please do poke the like button. If you'd like early access to the videos, then you can do so by supporting me on my Patreon page, which is linked in the description. You'll find a link to the Hellfreezer merchandise store on Teespring as well. If you enjoyed today's video, why not leave a tip? You can do so by clicking on the heart with the dollar sign just below the video. And you don't have to do that, but thank you if you choose to. Okay, no other business today, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And the answer of the day. And today's question is... Exotic food stuffs you want to try, but you've never actually gotten around to trying yet. That one's pretty easy for me. It's ruby chocolate. They apparently discovered a new kind of cocoa beans a little while back. And so they, they, they've made it into a type of chocolate, which is a little on the pricey side. But it's definitely on my list of yummy things to shove into my face. Also on that list is all those amazing Japanese Kit Kats that we just can't get here, which makes me very, very sad. But that's my answer. Why don't you let me know what yours are in a comment below. And before we go, let's have the answer of the day from a previous video. And this comes from the question in Revenge's Ice Cream 332, and that is, what is the rudest thing you've ever eaten or drank? 
think I mentioned an energy drink I was I was drinking at the time with a very naughty name. In fact, I remember that particular drink, uh, one of the local stores used to sell it, but they had the name censored out of it. It was like specially made cans, I guess, for that store. And anywhere else I've ever seen it, it's just had the name because you know, it's just the word pussy. It's, I think context counts in that case, but uh, I'm sure they knew what they were doing. And today's answer comes from Donna Michelle Rishi. Uh, 2878. Worms and dirt, which involves crumbly cake and gummy worms. Not really rude, but it sounds gross, and someone already said buttery nipple. Oh my. Uh, that one came from Raven Fox as an honourable mention there. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourself.